Coming up on this week's show, a new Xbox hack could make life a lot easier. Another Jeff Minter game comes to virtual reality. And we chat to Ali Motisi, who's using retro tech to make new indie games. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each and every Friday with our amazing mates at Bitmap Books. Now, one of my favourite books they've ever done, Game Boy, the box art collection. Now, despite its size, the Game Boy obviously wasn't short of classic games. And they brought together over 100 titles, box art photography, screenshots and expert commentary as a reminder of just how good Nintendo's handheld revolution was. So you can check out that and the rest of their retro gaming collection at bitmapbooks.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 417, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to the show. Of course, a podcast that every single Friday for the last eight-ish years now has kept you up to speed on all the big happenings in the world of retro gaming and technology, speaking to veterans of the industry, people that are making incredible new hardware and new software for retro titles, and of course, bringing it up to speed on what's been happening in the world of retro from over the last seven days with our consortium of cartridge connoisseurs. You like that? I like that. Yeah. I did like that. <laughs> I'm going to put that on my LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Headline for your LinkedIn profile. Yeah, or your email <laughs> signature. Put that yeah. in Yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we do on the podcast every week. Of course, we like to have a little roundtable about what's been happening in retro. And then at second half of the podcast is, I think, where the show really comes into its own. That's when we chat to all manner of people who are involved in retro gaming, you know, to put that broad umbrella over it in all its wonderful forms. And actually, this week, we're going to be talking to someone who um, makes modern games with a very big retro influence on them. And uh, someone actually you were hanging out with the other week, Ravi, at an, an event in Nottingham. Yeah, so we're going to be talking with uh, Ali Matisi, and he is the founder of Out of the Bit. You may know Out of the Bit from Full Void, which is yeah. oh, just such an amazing title. And it is kind of inspired by retro stuff but it's a modern title and Mm. we've seen a lot of this in the indie game scene where you're having you know retro inspired titles titles from certain genres that you know some people have seen as lost and um bringing them back for a kind of modern audience and getting them on modern systems like the xbox the switch but also on the evercade which is pretty cool because uh full void was the first independent title release on the Evercade. So the first single game on a cartridge. Yeah, it's normally Evercade titles are compendiums, aren't they, of several yeah, yeah. games on one cartridge. Usually it's a collection, but yeah. having a, a sole release um, on a cartridge is is pretty cool, especially in a, you know the modern age. And I love the Evercade. I think it's great. But um, Ali talks all about his history without the bit, kind of why he wanted to do it. And also, you know, um, some of their other titles like uh, Super Arcade Racing. Yeah, now out of the bit, I've got a really interesting history. I mean, you and I, Ravi, were obviously, we gravitate towards this because Ali's a huge Amiga nut, as we are, obviously. And we hear oh, about his course. history in, yeah. in Italy, growing up in Sicily and, you know, the, the Amiga scene out there. And then the thing I love about this is, I mean, we mentioned Full Void on the podcast when... It was first revealed about a year ago, didn't we? And if, for people that haven't played that, it is a, it's a game, like you said, for modern systems, um, including the Evercade, that is very heavily influenced by classics. You know, that, that rotoscope look, you know, games like Prince of Persia. Yeah, and, and, the, and the kind of shading as well. Mm. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, got that, it's got that kind of Amiga feel, but then it's got lots of new dynamics added in there. So, um, you know, Full Void is a mix of puzzle elements, platformers, and... Uh, it's also got running and chase sequences in there as well, and every single death is animated. And as you'll hear in a moment, the reason that it looks very authentic to the Amiga is because a lot of it was made on the Amiga. Yeah, which is mad, yeah, thinking, yeah. <laughs> making something on D-Pain and then putting it on the PlayStation 5. Yeah. Um, I just kind of love that journey. And it's got Amiga mod music as well, you know, made in Pro Track or Optimed. Um, in a lot of the titles as well. And, you know, even games like Super Arcade Football, I mean, for me, I, I didn't mention this in the interview, but modern football games. And, you know, I think you're the same, aren't you, Joe? Try and play FIFA 
I've, I don't know which character I'm controlling on the screen. I've, I've just not got an interest in it, yeah. unfortunately, with FIFA and stuff. I'd much it's be rather be playing It's not even FIFA anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's EA Sports. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, I've, got, I've, got, I've got mates who are like, you're really into it and you go around for a drink or whatever. Not oh, do you fancy a game on the PlayStation? I'm like, well, okay, if I have to. But if we go back to something like, you know, Sensible Soccer or Kickoff 2, even though I'm not the biggest football fan in the world, I can have fun with those games. And looking at Super Arcade Football, it's definitely heavily inspired by those games. And you mentioned about the racing uh, super arcade racer as well if you love games back in the day like uh, overdrive from team 17 yeah. and atr and uh, even like micro and super cars as well yeah that, those classic uh, top-down racing games um you'll definitely love the titles that out of the bit have released over the last couple of years and the good thing is as well i mean because when we mentioned it on the news about a year ago i remember looking at full void and thinking that is so up my street and just completely forgot to pick it up so after we were chatting to ali i went on the um, the switch east store picked it up for a fiver yeah. Which, uh, it, yeah, is, is just like, you know, absolute bargain. And particularly recently, because I was really hyped for Flashback 2, you know, that kind of long awaited proper sequel to the original Flashback that obviously came was out it, was years it ago. Now. Done? Uh, I didn't it? buy it in the end. I saw the reviews, <laughs> so many one star reviews, and people saying just how dreadful Ouch. it was. So this kind of fills that gap for me, you know, having a game that kind of feels like a sequel to Flashback that I can run on modern systems. So uh, if you're all interested in. Uh, how he uses Amigas to make, like you said, PlayStation and Xbox and Switch games. Really interesting chat with Ali Motisi from Out of the Bit, our special guest on the show, in around half an hour from now. Now, we have reached the end of February, so that does mean that this coming weekend, uh, Sunday evening, it is going to be Patrons Hangout, which we'll talk more about in just a bit, how you can get involved in that. Um, I did mention to Joe before that I've kind of double booked this weekend because my mum... Is they coming to stay? So get her on the hangout. <laughs> Going to say, might have a special guest on the hangout on Sunday night. Probably Do you not. remember Dan annoying you with? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Dan, request just for realize. video games as a youth. The amount of stories you'll ask her about and uh, lots of ways she could embarrass me. Maybe I'll just say, you know, pretend I'm <laughs> going out to, to tidy the garden for a couple of hours at, you know, 8pm in the dark on a Sunday night. So uh, that is going to be happening this coming weekend at theretrohour.com. If you want to join us on Patreon, we'll give you more details on that in just a bit. But there is lots of new stories to bring you up to speed on from over the last week, including a game that I've got to admit, whenever we talk about Star Wars on the podcast, I kind of feel like I should have my geek badge stripped off me. Absolutely. Because I'm not a Tear proper, it off his chest. I've never watched a Star Wars movie. You know what? It's it's funny because of the fact that you've never watched a Star Wars movie actually linked into this month's uh after hours episode we did for our Patreons last yeah. week. Uh which was the I can't believe you've never played. And it came from I can't believe Dan's never watched Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> um so yeah, I, I will take the lead on this week's news story. Hey, I've, I've gonna... watched all the Star Wars films, but I yeah. watched them later because I had to watch all the Star Trek uh, ones. And then... Yeah, you you but... two were brought up on Star Trek, weren't you? I get yeah. I'll give you that because you're both star you're both trekkies, weren't you? But I must admit well, I've probably I'll... played more Star Wars uh, games than times I've seen the movies, you know. Yeah, I was gonna say well, not only have I not watched uh any Star Wars films, but also I've never played any of the games as well. But I do know they've got a very good reputation. And it turns out if you love that Star Wars Battlefront, those games have been re-released in the collection that includes some uh, really impressive new content and uh, new playable characters as well. Yeah, so uh, I was a big, big, big fan of Star Wars Battlefront 2. That on the PS2 uh, used to play the, uh, the uh, I forget the name of it, I think it was like the Galactic federation mode or something uh, with my friends which is really really fun game those of who aren't familiar with it it's a essentially it was a big multiplayer uh star wars battle wasn't it ravi like 150 yeah years, 150 I, I, I occasionally played it because i played stuff like millennium falcon and um, yeah uh, i think it was battlegrounds as well yeah 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 um, yeah which was another one. But um i did see clips of this and i think i must have picked it up and played it i remember the at Walkers, walkers, yeah. yeah, yeah, on 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 the original one, but I've I've not played the second. Yeah, so the, the second one was very similar to the first one, just more content. Um, but it was it was online back on the PS2 and the original Xbox and PC, and you could do like sixteen players versus sixteen, but you'd have hundred and fifty troops like wow. on the map, and essentially it was it would be a big battle in classic Star Wars situations, so like the Battle of Hoth and. Uh, Battle of Endor and stuff like that. And it was based on the original trilogy and the prequel trilogies, you know, which came out in the late 90s. Was it out at the same kind of time as Jedi Knight Academy? 
Yes, and, it was. Uh, it was. Yeah, yeah. It was around the same time. They were. I think it was two thousand and four. I want to say number two came out. The first one was the year before. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I I did see the period it's in with yeah. Star Wars games because I remember at one point it went all Lego Star Wars, didn't it? For yeah. A long time. Lego Star Wars kind of came a little bit after this. Um, but Star Wars Battlefront, there's a really, really, really big, uh, you know, kind of like fan base there yeah. and to, to a point where you can still on PC, there is still, um, servers going for people playing Battlefront 2, oh, you know, cool. where they've kept them going and stuff like that, even though they were switched off, you know, officially years ago and you can still find them and go on there and play them. And there's just so much to do in these games. Um, and you know, they were ported to Xbox 360 and stuff like that, but you know, they weren't remastered or anything like that. And, uh, they've recently actually been taken off the game store. Ready for this, obviously ready for this, I imagine. (laughs) So we are getting a star Wars battlefront collection remaster, uh, which was announced at this week's Nintendo direct partner showcase, but it is going to be coming to all modern platforms and it will be released, uh, on March 14th. So only in about two or three weeks, and you will get Battlefront 1 and 2 on there. The whole game's obviously remastered with lovely remastered graphics, etc. All the original game modes will still be in there. And uh, as you said there, Dan, there is going to be a few upgrades, a few extra levels. So oh. there was a couple of DLC levels on the original Xbox version, such as Jabba's Palace, which is going to be included on this one. Um, and there's a couple of extra characters you'll be able to play as. So as part of the battles you would have. I can't remember. It's been a while since I played it, but if you're playing like really well, it will ask you when you die. Cause what it is, is you, when you die, you get to pick like your class, you know, do you want to be a normal soldier, like infantryman, or do you want to be like a heavy soldier or do you want to be an engineer? You know, and they'd all have different weapons and abilities. Mm. And if you are playing well, it asks you if you want to be a hero character. So if you're playing as the good guys, you could be a Jedi playing as bad guys. You get to be like Darth Vader or Boba Fett. And they're including some more heroes in this remaster. Sorry if this means nothing to you guys, but Kit Fisto and I'm going to say this wrong. Asaj Vantrez. I'm not actually too sure who that is. I don't know much about Star Wars, but I know enough not to pronounce the character name wrong. Otherwise you may get it. I'm not too sure who that character is. I do do consider myself a Star Wars fan. (laughs) It's interesting as well. There seems to be like a story behind um, Battlefront 3 and um, Free Radical as well and, and some cancellation and the development not happening because of issues with lucas arts as well so that actually that would be a great episode to do wouldn't it the story it of would, battlefront it, 3 if we would be a great to some of our friends at free yeah Radical. it yeah. would be a very good episode to do actually funny you should say that that's, that's one to put a pin in i think there Ravi. i wonder if yeah. this sells well maybe that could inspire it yeah that would be cool there was some mm. offshoot battlefront games for the psp and then obviously they relaunched the battlefront brand uh, with Battlefront, Star Wars Battlefront, and Star Wars Battlefront Two, by uh, in I want to say 2015 and 2017, they came out on modern consoles, uh, which were good games, but they removed a lot of what made the original. Uh, they kind of removed the board game element to it and the the campaigns as well. They were just online, massive multiplayer online. Um, but speaking of which, like I say, the original was like 16 players online. This one is going to be 64 players online wow. up to 64. So really, really big battles there, big, big space battles and on land battles and stuff. So I'm looking forward to this one. And uh, one thing that's exciting as well is there was a hero mode in the original game. Well, in Battlefront 2, where you could just have a game playing as heroes, but you could only play that on one level, which was Tatooine. And then now modding the game so you can play that on any of the levels which are included in the game. As uh, as a kind of... uh... A uh, trekker or trekky, I must say that um, <laughs> Star Wars definitely had the better games. <laughs> what what yeah. are Star Wars fans called? Are, are they Warsies? Warsies? What was that? What, was that is that game? Star Wars fans? If Trekkies, uh, Star Trek fans are Trekkies, are, are Star oh, Wars fans are Warsies? Yeah, I'm, stop, yeah. stop, stop, stop. I'm just like stop starting. <laughs> Just trying to get involved in the conversation. Go, go back to bed, Dad. <laughs> All right, okay, let's move on from Star Wars. No one cares about that. Uh, but if you do, yeah, the game's out in a couple of weeks' time, so uh, I'm sure that w- there'll be many people looking forward for to that. For all you Warsies. Yeah, for all you Warsies out there. Right, next one's story. Now, uh, this one I think is an exciting story. As someone who um, did mod an original Xbox, not quite back in the day. I think if you said back in the day, you'd, you'd imagine it was during the console's heyday. But I think I uh, soft modded my OG Xbox in around 2011, 2012. And uh, back then, I mean, I kind of assumed that most of the 
exploit methods had been explored and kind of, you know, were fully developed. And I don't know if you guys have ever modded an original Xbox, but I've got vague memories of needing, because you and I, Ravi, were talking before we recorded, you needed a game. I think it was uh, Splinter Cell. Was yeah, yeah. Made? There were certain games that had um, the ability to kind of exploit it in there. And, mm. uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because the whole original Xbox modding scene, I remember seeing some amazing stuff. And that's where uh, XBMC came from. Uh, the which, media center, yeah, yeah, ended up turning into Cody. Well, kind of a pioneer in like some of the stuff that we have today, <laughs> you know, um, even streaming and stuff like that. Um, all came from this kind of scene. Um, it's interesting because you needed the original game, and you also needed uh, an adapter which would go into the controller port and an old flash stick as well. And it's like the older f- flash stick that you used for it, the better. And then you'd have to run a soft mod tool and all of this kind of stuff. Well, how, why is that changed now, Dad? Well, I remember there was a bit more to it when I did it. I remember having to have my Xbox case open and oh God. A, a PC <laughs> with an IDE interface next to it. And then literally had to yank out the IDE cable from the Xbox drive and plug the PC into it so the PC could read the contents oh, so of the disc. Oh, wow. Okay. That's how you soft modded it because basically what the Xbox does is um, it locks the hard disk, but when the system's on, it's running and accessing it, it unlocks it. So what you need to do is quickly plug the PC in while the disk is unlocked. To Maybe change methods the have on like changed and been updated over the past few years. Well, I mean, it looks like now, I mean, you know, I remember doing that, I mean, a little bit nervous, you know, basically uh, hot swapping an IDE hard disk, um, which was never intended for that. But now there is a new original Xbox exploit that basically means there is potential to soft mod your console using just a memory card. I always forgot that the original Xbox had a memory card because I assumed it had the, you know, the hard drive inside on some of them. Um, but yeah, it, and you'd stick it in the controller as well, yeah. which was always a, always kind of a, a weird like the N64, thing. yeah, or the, or the Dreamcast. No, doing it from the memory card and loading an exploit probably means that you're going to uh, not need any crazy CD-ROM. Yeah, the same, this new uh, exploit, it's called Endgame. It is a universal dashboard exploit for the original Microsoft Xbox. And uh, the way it works, which I'm sure will make sense to some people out there, is it is an integer overflow in the dashboard's handling of save game images. So basically, you can put a, a save game image on the memory card, specially coded one, then the console will try to read it. It will then use this exploit and a, is then able to execute its code, basically. So at the moment, this is really just... Uh, you know, a method that they've discovered that's working on there where you don't need any uh, any games to do it. Apparently, you don't even need a working DVD drive. All you need is a memory card. And I guess you'll be able to obviously load anything on there and have, you know, region-free stuff as well. And uh, it's, it's it's got lots of benefits, but it sounds like it needs to get developed. Yeah, well, at the moment, they're saying basically this method, the vulnerability has been discovered. Right now, you can't use it to soft mod your console, but the fact that it exists... I imagine will mean that, you know, the soft modding community will jump on that and it will get kind of baked into... Yeah, just like yeah. free up boot, you know, you yeah. buy your memory card, put it in, and then pretty much done. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, there are some comments on the uh, on, on the tweet here. Uh, people saying, you know, what's the point in soft modding a, an original Xbox in 2024? Because I mean, when I did it, like, over a decade ago, the original Xbox was a really good system for emulation. mm I remember having like, you know, a, a menu on there with like loads of MAME arcade games on there, um, loads of Mega Drive and Super Nintendo games. Some Amiga games were on there as well, I remember, which obviously today you can do that a lot easier and, you know, a lot quicker using something like a Raspberry Pi. And and I, I don't know what the prices on Xbox games are, but um, Not every much. time I go into like secondhand shops, there's tons of them and they're... I've st- but I've still got a lot of nostalgia for it. And I'd love to also, you know, get on the 360 and uh, maybe have an old Xbox setup. Yeah, so um, if you are a fan of the uh, the original OG Xbox and you uh, want to run a very simple exploit on that, it looks like life could be made a lot easier very soon. So we'll keep an eye on that news story. 
Now, uh, we did mention the Evercade. We're going to be talking more about that with our guest in just a moment, Ali Montisi, uh, the founder of Out of the Bits, of course, who's got that incredible full void game on the Evercade. But there are lots of other titles that are on the system recently as well. Like we said, most of them are compilations. And there is a new compilation that's going to be on the system in April this year, the Pico Interactive Collection 4. Now, the reason this is making the headlines is this is the first time we've seen an N64 game running on the Evercade. Yeah, so the Evercade is kind of like advertised as being able to run, you know, 8-bit, 16-bit and 32-bit games. Can't think of many 32-bit games, if any, off the top of my head that I've seen on there yet. Um, so maybe they're just jumping straight to the yeah, end. They're the mainly like yeah, sixteen bit era stuff, aren't they? That I've played yeah. on there. That's the main. Yeah, it, it pretty much like NES, Mega Drive, SNES kind of stuff, isn't it? And then obviously modern indie stuff, Atari Lynx collection, Atari there, Lynx good, collections, yeah. yeah, and stuff like that. But yeah, Glover sixty four is going to be on this collection, uh, which is interestingly the only kind of like sixty four bit game on this collection because there is ten games on there. Uh, I won't go through all of them, but Street Racer, Star X. Oh, Risky I love Woods, Street Racer. Mavdink, uh, great title. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Bad Street Brawler, um, Zero Tolerance Underground on there as well, which are all kind of like 8-bit and 16-bit games, or depending on which version of it it is. Because uh, I know Street Racer came out on... Well, Street Racer came out on everything, didn't it? Yeah, they even got an Amiga release, I think. Back an Amiga, yeah, 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 it came out on everything. But yeah, the reason this is doing the rounds is because of Glover 64, uh, being on there and uh, obviously this isn't out yet um, comes out in know, April comes out in April but it's you know the emulation of it and everything you know from just the little 30 second demo they've put out there you know they're kind of saying you know this is what we had on it before now we've got 64 bit emulation on there so I think you know it it's very you know only a very few seconds you see kind of the game running and everything looks fine obviously you know the uh the, the internet can lie to you and stuff like that. But Evercade are generally, I, I can't see them doing that. I can't see them lying they, or anything like they, that. They so. generally care a lot about their yeah. releases and put a lot of pride into them. More exactly. and more, I'm looking at the Evercade as the system I want to get. Like, I've been looking at all these mini releases and mini consoles and stuff, and they don't really appeal to me. I like the idea of someone actually picking games for me and yeah. uh, being able to plug them in and actually play them and swap them out that way rather than sitting with endless lists and um, going through stuff or having to soft mod my mini console or load stuff on a USB. Like, you know, it it, it does seem nice. And um, they also seem reasonably priced as well. Yeah, they're definitely reasonably priced. And I, w- I would say the cartridges do as are as well. And, and, and I know what you're saying there. It's kind of like that doom scrolling for games now. Yeah. You know, we have that many games accessible to us. It's nice to have, I guess, a cartridge with like five or six or yeah, and ten it's, it's, games. It's like ninety, it kind of it's like ninety quid for the Evercade VS. You know? Yeah, yeah, not too bad at all. But yeah, Glover sixty four. It you know bit of Vaseline looking graphics, you know, on there as per the N sixty four. But if it runs well and it's a success, it'll be cool to see what kind of you know other games they can kind of get the license for and get on there. I I, I'm, I obviously imagine it'll be third party. Yeah, it, 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 it probably won't be Nintendo stuff. Will no, it? or Rare maybe, because obviously Rare is Microsoft now. So it'll be interesting to see what we do get on there. I've but never yeah. played Glover before. It looks a bit weird, this game. So it kind of looks a bit like a... Uh, it's a puzzle platformer. A, yeah, but you don't play a... You play a glove, hence yeah. the name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, not, not a concept I've seen before in a video game. Um, but yeah, I do think that is really impressive because I mean, the Nintendo 64 is notoriously a tricky system to emulate well. Yeah. Um, and the fact that, you know, it's running, if this does run smoothly, which I imagine it will on, you know, what is essentially quite limited hardware. It must mean they've optimised it very well, and yeah, kind of opens the door to maybe more. Like you said, well, you're, you've game. got the analog 3D, you know, which is that accurate um, N64 kind of emulator. It'd be nice to see how this, um, you know, pitches up. Yeah, the fact that this is running nicely on there is quite a big leap. So um, yeah, if you're a fan of uh, the games from Interactive Studios back in the day, nice little collection, including that um, N64 port Glover that is going to be out in April. Pre-orders are available on the Evercade website right now. Now, there's a couple more stories before we hop into our guest this week. Ali Mortisi coming up in just a second. Uh, now, Jeff Minter, can we do the uh, the Wayne's World We're Not Worthy thing? 
We're not Jeff's worthy. Mentor. We're doing it now. Um, I mean, obviously, we love Jeff. Had him on the podcast a good few years ago now. Um, interviewed him live at Play Expo, I remember. Um, Ravi and I playing around on his, uh, his new one. Yeah, also featured Tempest. him in our book as well. Yeah, yeah, recently, um, if, if you missed that interview, it's in our, the Retro Hour book as well. And I've always loved Jeff's games. I even go back to, like, you know, games of his I played on the Amiga back in the day. And he's definitely kind of found a niche in the psychedelic shooters in recent years. I mean, obviously, he did all the, you know, the stuff like Tempest on the uh, on the Jaguar and that Defender clone he did on there as well. He's really known for kind of updating classic arcade games and giving them that really trippy psychedelic look in recent years. And um, one that I loved on the PlayStation VR a couple of years ago, and I'll be honest, you know, I got a PlayStation VR for the PS4, barely used it. The only game I really regularly came back to that, not really a console, the add-on for, was Polybius, which was a uh, a Jeff Minter shoot 'em up game that worked so well in virtual reality. Did you guys ever play that when I had my PSVR set yeah, up? Yeah. yeah, I played it. And, you know, I think the stuff about, like, Jeff Minter's games, obviously, Tempest is amazing, but um, stuff like the virtual light machine and having that kind of light synthesis in there as well. Um, I, I recently wrote an article um, about Tripatron, which was uh, a light synthesizer by Jeff Minter, and those visuals work really well in VR, you know, um, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. I, I really enjoyed Polybius. It was a tough game though. Yeah. And I got quite far into it. And weirdly, when you're playing that game, cause you know, you think does it what, does shoot them up work in VR. That was my initial impression when I got it, but actually you kind of go into a, <laughs> a bit of a, a Zen like kind of state. Yeah. You've got to get it. into the zone with that game. Definitely. Yeah. And I love that. Like I said, it was really the main reason that I got my original PSVR set up just to play Polybius. Well, it turns out Jeff Minter's latest game, which, uh, how do you pronounce this, Joe? You were practising this earlier. Ak- Aka-a. Aka-a. <laughs> Aka-a. Uh, <laughs> it's coming to the, uh, the PSVR 2 next month. Now, we were looking into the history of this because um, they're basically saying it's, you know, a classic Atari game that's been brought back for VR. That's kind of the headline I've seen everywhere. Um, actually, it's got quite a an interesting history because this was a game that should have come out back in the early 80s from Atari. But actually, um, it was made by two Atari employees, Mike Halley and uh, Dave Ralston. And the name Aka R is a play on words for also known as another Ralston Halley production. Um, It was shown to a little test market back in 1982. Obviously, you know, the peak of the Atari um, arcade titles around that time. But apparently the test market didn't like it. And they found the game was too difficult, it, it, so Atari scrapped it back then. It's interesting to see as well because um, this is the modern Atari, and uh, maybe they've changed their their kind of tone because um, you know eight years ago they threatened to sue <laughs> Jeff Minter yeah. <laughs> for for his title being uh, too similar to Tempest. So you know, <laughs> there's, uh, now they're working together. It's it's kind of good to see because he's got a good history with Atari, but uh, there there has been ups and downs. Yeah, now um, this looks like, again, you know, if you like Polybius, another psychedelic arcade shooter game. Um, It's actually released on all the main platforms today at the time this podcast comes out, 22nd of February, um, on the Switch, PlayStation, Steam, PS, all of that, uh, Xbox. Yeah, there is going to be a version of it coming to the PSVR 2 next month. Now, in terms of VR, I remember you about a year ago, Joe, picking up a (laughs) Meta Quest 2. Yeah. And saying to me, oh, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to ever play anything else. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. What did I say to you at the time? I've got one, it gathers dust. Yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> you're not wrong. Like I got, so I got a new job about a year and a half ago. And to celebrate, yep. I got a MetaQuest 2 because I really, really wanted to play the Resident Evil 4 VR, which is on there, which is based on the original. It's not based yeah. on the uh, the uh, remake. And uh, yeah, I... I pff, I, I, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say it. I did say to Dan, like, I I generally don't see myself like, you know, I was kind of half joking. Like, I didn't think I'd ever not play Xbox and stuff like that again. Yeah. But I was like, this is insane. Like, I loved it. Like, and I found that so immersive because obviously it put it into a first person perspective for you. And, you know, you're pulling the guns out of your holsters yourself and your shotgun off your back and all that fighting you know, zombies or Ganados, they're called. Nobody shout at me. And, uh, 
<laughs> yeah, like it was just insane. And now obviously this is kind of like a top down shooter kind of tower defense game. Yeah. Obviously in true kind of Jeff Minter style, like it is incredibly colorful and psychedelic. And I'd be scared that I'd lose my mind playing this in VR. <laughs> like, did you ever play Polybius on play my PSVR? It. I want to play it on the Apple yeah. Apple Vision Pro whilst walking through the streets of London. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um, really psychedelic. I did play the Polybius on yours. Yeah. Um, I think I played it for about five minutes and then I played it at the, um, you know, the Nottingham Video Game Museum when we had that National Video Game Museum yeah. before it moved. Played Poly- Polybius on, on PSVR there as well. Once again, for about five, ten minutes before it was like, okay, I've had enough of this. And they were like, oh, but you can play it for as long as you want. And I was like, no, no. Yeah, my, my, <laughs> my stomach disagrees. Yeah, it's yeah. wicked, but Jesus, I'm like... Yeah, my my stomach and my head is just, this is crazy kind of thing. And, and maybe that's just because at the time I hadn't played VR too much. And yeah, you've got to then, find your VR legs, I think they call it, don't they? You know, yeah, the more, yeah. The more you're used to it, yeah. 100%. But yeah, just going back to what you said, yeah, my, my, my Meta Quest 2 is now sat in a drawer gathering <laughs> dust. But it did get hammered for about two, three months across about two or three games. But yeah, I, I really like the look of this. I just, I can't see it. And I, you know, I know he's such a legend, but I can't see myself playing this for too long. You've you, you've not been to enough uh, uh, sketchy parties, Joe. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe that is the. Yeah, uh, you've got to ride, ride it. Life, you've yeah. got to ride it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, to me, I'm looking at this, and I would love to play this in virtual yeah. reality. I mean, if it came out on the on the Quest Two, that might be a reason for me to set mine up again. I'm not going to fork out like four or five hundred quid for a PS VR two to play this game because that's the thing I want to love virtual reality and I've got the PSVR one you know I use that again when I first got it it's that novelty isn't it you yeah. load and then yeah. I thought maybe it's just all the wires maybe that's why I don't well, like I, it I, I had the make. Vive and I thought you know uh, oh, this well HTC Vive 2 and I was plugged into my computer and making sure I didn't run off too fast and pull all the wires out and stuff and it you know I've, I've kind of been lost on the on the on the VR appeal but um, you know there's always a, a new device or something that always looks exciting. Like I've, I've seen there's Apple Vision Pro videos everywhere at the moment on uh, every channel talking about how they're using it, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got the MetaQuest 2 as well again. Played that loads when I first got it. Haven't used it for about eight, nine months maybe now. Yeah, but there's, um, there's some people that, you know, jump on everything. I can imagine there's going to be like someone spinning around in a Tesla coming out with a Vision Pro and... Uh, I've seen that already <laughs> on YouTube, yeah. <laughs> Power gloves and all of this kind of stuff. Even the other day, though, I was in Curry's and I was looking at the Meta Quest 3 thinking, hmm. <laughs> so I did I stop did, myself I before I did that. Day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's the AR one. Um, but I mean, I, I do love new technology and I love it when retro and kind of new tech get merged together. But, you know, there is, I still need something to hook me into VR. I don't know. They maybe need a VR something. cafe where you can go and try them yeah. all out and you don't have to buy it and it gathers dust, you know? <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you're a fan of these Jeff Minter games, though, I mean, I'll, I'll be buying this on the Switch to play, you know, in 2D. Uh, but if you have got a PSVR 2, could be a, a nice little addition to your collection. Because like I said, Polybius, absolutely awesome. If you haven't played that, definitely worth a download. Now, um, what's the best thing you guys have ever found in charity shops or thrift stores as are? I found an original box version of Doom for about £2.50. That was pretty amazing. I'm trying to think. I've got a sealed copy of Martian Gothic for the PC in my cupboard. Big box version of it. It was a Martian Gothic was a uh, Resident Evil clone that came Mm. out in the late 90s. I've got a sealed copy. It's my only sealed game I've got, like, which is retro. Found that in a charity shop for a pound. Wow. It's yeah. always great when... I mean, it's rare to find decent stuff in charity shops yeah. over here these days. I remember finding a, uh, a a Dreamcast keyboard and mouse in a charity shop about seven, eight years ago. By the only really cool thing I think I've found, and they were about a pound each as well, um, in the box. In between new. the copies of FIFA. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was it, yeah. It, in between, it yeah. Nicely. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> between FIFA 2000 up to 2015. Um, but this... Sounds like a very interesting score. Now, a rare prototype of a game that actually has been getting <laughs> quite a bit of coverage recently. Um, we've been talking about it quite a lot recently, thanks to that new uh, RZ or Arzetti, however you pronounce it, game, mm-hmm. which we talked about, you know, a few months ago. This was kind of that uh, that game that's based on those terrible Philips CDI 
Mario and Zelda games. Um, Hotel Mario, I think, is kind of the one that most people think of. Um, because it turns out that apparently a guy who was browsing Goodwill, which is a charity shop in America, came across a rare prototype version of Hotel Mario for the Philips CDI. Yeah, so this is a YouTuber who's called Game Pack Rat, who is only a small YouTuber. And uh, he mainly, by the looks of things, his his channel is him going thrift shopping and looking for video games and kind of pop culture related kind of items. You know, cook, you know those cook. videos are always therapeutic, aren't they? Like yeah, LGR's I, thrifts and yeah, uh, yeah. Pat the NES punks videos back in the day. Yeah, he, I, he I, goes to a lot of uh, Goodwill shops and uh, yeah, mm. checks them out. You know, yeah, yeah. So just kind of going around all of them and stuff. And yeah, he has found <laughs> Hotel Mario and. Uh, it was in on. It's printed on a blank disc, as these these beta copies tend to be. So it's the beta copy of Hotel Mario, and uh, it was just an empty white jewel case CD. And he says, as a thrifter, he tends to check these when he sees them in the CD racks and stuff, just to double check. Very wise. And, and as he said, he actually found uh, a banjo kazooie soundtrack, and you know, like in just in like an empty disc once, you know, just the disc in like a empty CD case kind of thing. So he always checks them just to see if some random disc has been put in there. And yeah, printed on the front is Beta Hotel Mario. And the date is the 23rd of the 11th, 1993, which is a year or so before the game actually came out. Right. And, you know, top bloke, he's put a video up already of the intro of the game and he's going to dump the ROM for everybody, you know, to download and have a go on and stuff like that. Uh, with a few of the differences, but the main kind of difference at the start is in the final version, Mario reads a letter, which it kind of explains, you know, the point of the game. You're going to save Peach from uh, seven worlds of hotel worlds, um, and it's Mario who reads it out. Whereas in this beta version, it's Bowser who reads it out. Right. It's a different voice actor to who was actually in the final version of the game who played Bowser. And also says there's eight worlds rather than seven worlds, which I would suggest due to time constraints, maybe a world got cut from the game. But yeah, like how insane is that? Like such a, it's yeah. quite a rare sought after game anyway, just because obviously it's not. <laughs> not not because game. it's good. Yeah. The opposite <laughs> do, do you think Nintendo are going to take it down? Um, Ooh, when he puts a copy up, would they? <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe they will. If they, The only reason they would is because of embarrassment. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't even care. And bring about more Hotel attention Mario. to it. Yeah, maybe. But do they actually own the rights to this game because of the whole yeah. weird Philips CDI deal collab, thing they yeah. had collab they had? But what I think is lovely is he said he's putting it out there for everybody to free for free and everything. The only thing he asks in the return is to subscribe to his channel or watch some of his videos to get him a few more views. Which hopefully he will. He's got two thousand subs at the moment, and this latest video has got fifty k views in two days. Yeah, uh, which is pretty cool for him. I, I always I wonder. Oh, sorry. I always wonder these kind of people finding stuff in thrift stores. Are they targeting like certain areas where they know video companies were? Maybe. Um, you know, yeah. like Maybe. I can imagine the Silicon Valley uh, thrift stores were were full of people in like the nineties and two thousands, and uh, would have regular people or uh, places like Seattle as well, and. Uh, you know, big development places. In the UK, we have the Silicon Roundabout, so maybe um, some charity shops near there it's might have some beaters. <laughs> interesting you say that because of uh, Metal Jesus Rocks. He lives in Seattle, and hmm. they had, um, oh, God, Sierra Games, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, they were there, and he finds a lot of their kind of stuff yeah, in, yeah. in uh, you know, in the thrift shops and stuff like that. And interestingly, he's found, like, the N64DD, he found a few years ago, but an American one, which was never released. Yeah, that's the <laughs> ultimate find, that is. Yeah, that was like the ultimate find as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think you're right there, Ravi. <laughs> I think if you kind of go around the thrift shops in the areas of these game companies, you, yeah. you might find something eventually, yeah. Yeah, Ravi's on booking his flight right now. Um, yeah, very, very cool, though. So if you want to check out that um, previously unseen beta gameplay of uh, Hotel Mario for the Philips CDI, we'll link that video up and, of course, the rest of the stories. And hopefully he will uh, get that image dumped so you can download the ISO file and uh, there's no copy protection on the CDI or you can play it on an emulator. So uh, it will be quite interesting to see. So I'll put that and, of course, the rest of the stories. You don't have to Google around. I'll save you the job each week. I'll put them in the show notes on your podcast app or head to the website at the Retro Hour. 
Now, the shortest month of the year is almost out of the way. That does mean last Sunday of the month, Patrons Hangout is coming up this weekend. Uh, always a bit of a giggle, isn't it? And uh, it's nice to catch up with our community. We talk about so many different subjects on the Hangouts. And uh, I love it when people show off their collections, stuff they picked up over the last month or so, when we get advice off people. And it's just a wonderful community that we built up around this podcast. Yeah, we always see new people as well. Yeah. And uh, it's great to have like new energy and, uh, you know, we've done them at different times as well. And we've got uh, different people and I can imagine it's quite tough for some people getting on it at certain times with time zones and stuff. Yeah, so we're going to be doing this month's Hangout, uh, Sunday evening, 8pm UK time, 8 till 10. So basically, if you haven't been on before, it's a massive Zoom call, isn't it? Or actually Google Meets. We all get together, uh, loads of people on the screen, we'll just chat about retro stuff, geeky stuff. So if you'd like to join us for that, um, as Ravi said, we're always very welcoming of new members as well. So if you join our Patreon community today, you will get an invite for that this weekend. And uh, the bonus podcast that we do, just for our gold members and above, which actually we've just recorded, episode 40. Oh, wow. This week, which is nuts. And this was one of the most fun episodes I think we've ever done of the After Hours. It was a, it was an interesting one. We did the, uh, as I said earlier on the show, I can't believe you've never played. And we all got, well, we didn't pick it. We all picked free games for each yeah. other. Games we've never played or experienced before to go play and give our thoughts on. And we all kind of fell into our own little, like, genre or yeah, but, of time but put gaming, it on, we? but put it on the other people. So I got, yeah. I got kind of like very Joe Nintendo y yeah. suggestions, and, and I got uh, very Ravi yeah. <laughs> suggestions. <laughs> that and was then it. Dan got a bit of a mix, didn't you? Yeah, and there's a bit of controversy in here because Joe and I actually slagged off two massive franchises. Yeah, uh, we did. Yeah, we did. I've always <laughs> seen a bit of chatter about that Discord. <laughs> so uh, if you want to get access to that, and actually we do a video version of the After Hours podcast. You know, I've been trying video on that show as well. So if you join us as a gold member above, you unlock all previous 40 episodes and you can check out the video version of the podcast as well. So all the details to send up on our Patreon are at the website, theretrohour.com. And of course, we'd like to welcome new members of our Patreon into the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming. And that is the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. (laughs) And a massive welcome to Seb. Justin Jutzman Hickman. And Rodney Undercoffler. Who all joined us on Patreon over the last week or two. We hugely appreciate your support. And if you'd like to join our wonderful Patrons community, as I said, all the details are at theretrohour.com. Right then, Patrons, stay locked. There are some more news stories on the way for you because we chop all the adverts out of the Patrons version of the show. So we have a couple of extra news stories just for our Patrons every week. We'll do those in just a sec. For everybody else, thank you so much for checking out the news this week and enjoy our special guest talking about developing modern games using classic systems like the Amiga and, of course, that wonderful game, Full Void, with our special guest, Ali Motisi. He's next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and we're here today with Ali Mottizzi, and he's the founder of Out of the Bit, also producer and lead developer of the fantastic Full Void. How are you doing, Ali? Yeah, very good. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Retro Hour, so I'm very excited to be here with you tonight. Well, you'll probably know our first question that <laughs> we ask every single guest, and that's, uh, what was your first gaming experience? Okay, let's see. So uh, I grew up in a small village in the 80s in, in Sicily, the south of Italy. Um, like many people, I spent my youth uh, disassembling toys uh, to see how they worked, especially my sister's toys. <laughs> She's not very happy about that. Uh, but I also remember looking at uh, computers in uh, films and series like Knight Rider, and I was al- always intrigued by those. Uh, at some point, I went to my cousin, and he just got a Commodore 64, and I love the machine. Uh, so I asked for, you know, I wanted to learn to have a computer of my own. So I asked my parents to get a Commodore 64. And they went and bought me a BBC Micro, which, you know, <laughs> I was very happy with. Uh, because to be fair, it was a great choice. It came with um, with a guide uh, to learn uh, BBC Basic, and which was very good. So, yeah, I guess, you know, looking at films and then, um, you know, I got my, my own computer when I was eight. I think the BBC Micro as well, the fact that you got that in, in Italy, that's quite interesting. Because obviously that was a, a very big machine over here in the educational market in the UK. You know, it was the industry standard, really. So it's quite interesting that that system expanded to Italy. 
Yeah, yeah. Funny enough, I discovered later on, so it was an Olivetti PC-128S, the specific model, is basically a, a BBC Master um, rebranded by Olivetti, which was a big brand in Italy. That's why most of my games were um, British, basically. And mm. we kind of started my uh, interest with, um, with the UK and the um, uh, British gaming scene as well. So you did a bit of playing with BASIC as well. Did you uh, move on to any more advanced languages? And uh, where were you kind of getting your coding examples from? Yeah, again, there was the guy that came with the machine, which was very well put together. It was translated in Italian. Uh, so I could learn from the guide. Uh, but I mostly did BASIC at the time. I was very young. I was eight. So I never advanced. I did a bit of pick and poke and stuff, but nothing to advance until I was um, older. And did you have any like formal training with uh, computers at all later on as you grew up or or did you just get into it as a hobby? I got into it as a hobby uh, for myself, but then later on I went to uh, university to study um, engineering, like computer science. Okay. And uh, I did my formal you know, training with the programming and, and all the rest of it. But I always, always program um, ever since I was eight, just because I liked it. So I mostly learned basic C and C++ on my own, Java as well. And by the time I was a uni, I was already uh, programming. Were you making any uh, games or anything at home then and kind of giving them out to your friends or releasing them like a shareware or anything like that? Yes, yes, uh, I did at the time as well. Uh, and after the BBC Micro, I moved on, on to the Amiga, which I loved. And I know you guys are big fans of the Amiga as well. Oh, yes. And uh, uh, funny enough, even though the, it was a small town, there was an Amiga club in the town uh, where people could, uh, because that was before the internet, right? So it was hard to get to any knowledge of people that had knowledge of programming and stuff. So having the club was really great. People were getting demos from um, abroad and tampering with them, modifying the demos. Uh, writing games and uh, nothing too serious at the end of the day, but we, we, you know, we all practice and exchange stuff. It was pretty good fun. So, did you code with any of your friends, and uh, h- how come Out of the Bit was formed? Yeah, uh, basically, when I uh, when I finished uni, um, I um, got a job in Sicily, but there is not a lot in terms of uh, game development. Uh, so I had a look at the UK, and at the time, um, the first mobile phones were getting started with screens, and uh, there were a lot of jobs. So I decided to move to London uh, to uh, make games, basically, for, for uh, early mobile phone. That was before the iPhone. So if you remember the early Java-enabled phones, they were very similar to like the games you will find at the Amiga or the Super Nintendo and I think that was quite nice. Uh, so it was a nice transition for me to start writing those games. And then obviously phones got more and more capable until um, the iPhone launch. So at that point, I was working for other companies. And when the iPhone launched, I saw the opportunity to start my own company uh, because at the time I had no kids and no mortgage. So it was a lot easier to take risks. So I left my job and, and started out a bit uh, which was, again, a bit of a risk, but uh, uh, it was a good opportunity uh, because with the iPhone, all you needed at the time was a laptop, a Mac, mm. and then you could write games and put them on the App Store. And you, you're right. Some of those games were quite cool, actually. That uh, J2ME stuff, I remember. Um, I think it was Sonic CD. It was yeah. a, a really nice mobile port back then. Yeah, absolutely. I love working uh, with the uh, uh, Java Micro Edition. Uh, also because of the limitation of those phones. So I always found that limitations are quite nice in terms of overcoming the challenge and try to make something good, which, you know, in the retro scene nowadays, people do amazing stuff with those classic machines. So it's, it's always a challenge, but there is a big reward when you manage to do what you want. Uh, mm. And then, uh, as I was saying, once the iPhone launched, then I started the company and I kind of made... Um, classic games for the iPhone and the iPad, and then slowly transition to more complex games, kind of growing the company slowly. I guess that kind of early indie gaming scene on mobile, it must have been quite reminiscent of, you know, the, like the 16-bit systems and stuff you're doing like back on the Amiga and, and that kind of stuff, was it? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. It was same resolution pretty much as the Amiga. 
uh, so standard pixel uh, graphic and uh, and yeah it was even the input some of the early phones uh, some of the Sony and Nokia had a little joystick which was a bit fiddly but it was quite fun too <laughs> when you managed to play a game like that I, I remember on the Sony Ericsson yeah it was yeah. like a li- little joystick kind of yeah. knob yeah <laughs> exactly well, also at that time when you started it, indie games started to get really taken seriously. You know, there were there were titles like uh, I think it was two thousand and eight, like Braid that came out, and you know, seeing these kind of titles getting respect, did that kind of push you in that direction away from the mobile market? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so my passion was always like um, games, like games for the Amiga, Mega Drive, Super Nintendo, that kind of games. Uh, I really love the classic pixel art games. And when everything transitioned to 3D at the time when we had the like PlayStation and Nintendo 64, it was great, but uh, we kind of lost a little bit of the, you know, small teams creating very creative games. Yeah. Uh, so because teams got bigger, of course, and things uh, kind of changed a little bit, you know. Uh, they're still great games, but I always love the scouting of, like games made by smaller teams, right? And uh, so that, like, like you're saying with the um, indie scene around the time, uh, I remember I went to watch the indie game, the movie, uh, and it, I was very impressed with what very small team, like one, two people managed to do really. So that kind of inspired me as well at the time to tackle more complex projects and say, okay, if maybe maybe we can try and do something more more interesting here. You know, in, in that kind of pre-iPhone mobile game scene, how did you distribute the games then? Because, I mean, I remember even, like, you know, the App Store launching on the iPhone was a big deal. I've got vivid memories of trying to download games on my PC for my Nokia, then loading them via, like, serial port or USB onto yeah. it. I mean, was it, was it difficult to distribute them and get attention back then? Uh, absolutely, you're right. It was very expensive. You need a server and send some kind of WAP push message uh, to the client, and then people will have to... First, have an internet connection, which wasn't granted. It was very expensive as well. Then download the game, and then on most phones, you could install it. But it was very, very cumbersome and very expensive to, to manage. That's why I wanted to start my own company, but it was very expensive. Uh, and then the iPhone kind of solved that problem because I could just distribute my games anywhere very easily. And then so, Steam did the same, of course. Yeah, yeah, Steam and Steam really later on embraced uh, yeah, indie titles yeah. as well. Um, how did you end up going then from mo- mobiles to super arcade racing? Basically, we started doing more and more original games um, on the App Store. Uh, keep in mind, uh, Autobit is being funded in, in like 2008. We never had any investor, any money coming into the company. We just grew the company very slowly. So we had to be careful with taking risks. So what we did initially was uh, release a, 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 a bunch of classic board games, right? And expanded the, the portfolio slowly. And at some point I wanted to try something more original. So we developed a rhythm game uh, on the iPhone, which was called Planet Quest. That was very, very successful. We had like millions of downloads, especially in Asia. They really like rhythm games. And uh, yeah, that, that was quite a surprise for us and kind of uh, allow us to do um, other more original titles. And uh, I'm a big fan of, like I said, uh, Amiga games like Sensible Soccer or uh, Overdrive for Team 17. So I thought, you know, maybe we can, we can create something uh, similar to those games, but with uh, expanded features, maybe online. And that's why, you know, we had the idea of, of making something for PC as well which wasn't mobile first or touch first as an input. So we, yeah, the the, the first project was Super Arcade uh, Racing and then football as well. Yeah, I mean, for people that haven't played this game, um, it's it's available on Steam now, came out uh, about a year ago. It looks very much, I mean, I, I remember games on the Amiga like uh, ATR, you know, all-terrain racing by Team 17. Supercars as well. Yeah, even Micro Machines as well. I mean, graphically, were, were they much of an inspiration for this and gameplay-wise? Yeah, we look at many, many games. Uh, personally, I, I, I really like Overdrive by Team 17. Not many people are like that game. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember to... that. I had a cover <laughs> yeah. disc of that, actually. I did, did they have yeah. rockets on the cars and stuff like that? Uh, no, drive? that was Roadkill, I think. Oh, Roadkill, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I played that one as well. Uh, I tried to play again 
uh, overdrive and I, I'm I'm terrible now. <laughs> but at the time I liked it and I liked it. I always like top down racing games. Uh, so there, there was really a fun project to do. Uh, we really went to town with the story. Obviously, compared to the older system, now we got more memory. Uh, you can have like more uh, content basically for the game. So we created. Um, I, I went on to create a custom engine in Civ to make pixel art games uh, because I wanted to do something that could be ported anywhere, not just for the iPhone, right? Uh, so uh, racing and football, so super arcade racing and super arcade football are the first game created with a serial box, our um, engine. And that really allow us to uh, go to town with the pixel graphic and the animations and uh, also to make sure we supported um, as many platforms as we could and including online as well. Yeah, I mean, talking about assembling that team then, I mean, how did you kind of get the team together? And uh, I mean, looking at these, these are some gorgeous pixel graphics on here. I mean, how, how did they go about creating those graphics and finding a pixel artist that will kind of, you know, retain those kind of authentic style? Yeah, that, that's tricky. You're right. And thankfully, the company is located in Wimbledon in London. So it's quite easy to reach out to people and find a lot of talent in terms of location. Uh, I, I put an ad and I look at lots and lots of CVs and I came across a very talented uh, pixel artist, uh, Dave, and he actually worked back in the day on the Mega Drive as well. He's done a bunch of titles on the Mega Drive. Nice. Very experienced, very talented um, pixel artist. And that, you know, uh, and together that's um, basically with Dave, we did the graphic for football and racing. Uh, it is really good. And you guys would like this one, actually. Uh, when I set up uh, his computer, he told me, I, I work with this old software. You probably don't know this. It's called Deluxe Paint. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, I know this software. <laughs> and did he, he still of, use that to make the game then? Did he, did he do a lot yes. of graphics and D-Paint? Wow. Yes, he used D-Paint, but he's so fast with it. You will not believe it. It's incredible. To watch him draw is insane. And so I actually said, no, I know the paint. And uh, so I had to set up an emulator and he had his own copy of the paint with all the assets, his, his own animations. And he's so fast with it. He's incredible. Uh, so yeah. And now he's like kind of retired, he still does freelance work from time to time, but we're still in, uh, in touch. And he's a great pixel artist. He's so good at animating. Uh, we had really fun with the football racing. That explains why they look so authentic then if he's done it on, on the Amiga. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. He's done it on the paint, yeah, and, uh, entirely. And that title uh, ended up going on to PS5 as well. And Yeah, um, correct. You know, uh, what was it kind of like instead of being on the mobiles going on to the consoles? Ah, it felt great. After many, many years of doing mobile games, mobile games are great, but uh, with time, uh, mobile changed. It became full of currency, microtransactions, advertising. Uh, one of the things we do out a bit, obviously we have to put ads in our mobile games because that's how you monetize, but we always give people the option to just pay a flat fee and just remove the ads because I, I like, you know, some people may want to play with kids or they want to see ads. So it's nice to have the option to pay and remove ads. And also the controls, right? There are so many games you can do which are great on mobile, like, you know, Cut the Rope and Fruit Ninja, these kind of games, Angry Birds. But sometimes other types of games, you really want to have a joy part, like, uh, or a joystick. And also implementing stuff like, you know, multiplayer on the PlayStation Network. Um, w was that tough to do or was that all within your engine? Yes, uh, it was... Engine-wise, it was very easy. We ported the, the engine on PlayStation a couple of days. Uh, same with Xbox. Very easy to port the engine. The problem is obviously uh, if you go cross-play with different platform, then mm. there is a bunch of requirements. Uh, correctly so, you know, for safety and security. So there is a lot of requirements to satisfy, and that's what takes time normally for consoles, the certification process. A little things are important, you know, back and forth. Uh, it's mostly like this kind of uh, agreements and bureaucracy that takes time. Uh, but overall, it was great to port on the, on the consoles, you know. obviously the game coming from yeah. Deluxe Paint to the latest piece of hardware, which yeah, is it's... a great path, yeah. <laughs> yeah Amiga yeah, graphics on the PS5 is something very cool about that, I think. Exactly. <laughs> we always make fun because we go, oh, we are really... Now, at the moment, we are porting the games to the PS5, right? And we are like, oh, we are really using this GPU, 
yeah, we're, we're really pushing the GPU here. <laughs> but it speaks <laughs> a lot. <laughs> but, you know, I there mean, is a market for that. People like retro games and PS5 oh, yeah. as well. So. <laughs> and I think they're very at home on the Switch as well. I mean, obviously the Switch is a different architecture to the, the PS5 and the Xbox Series X. I mean, was, was porting it to that system a, a different challenge? And what about kind of getting Nintendo's approval? How does that kind of work? Is that uh, so, loopholes you got to go through there? Yeah, you're yeah, right. No, it was it was actually great fun. It was so incredible for me, you know, having grown up with the Game Boy and Game Boy Advance, Nintendo DS as well. Having my games on Nintendo was great. It was so good. And uh, the process was actually quite straightforward. Uh, you you had to get used to it, right? Because uh, it's a bit more complex than the App Store or Steam. That they're like more uh, like the process is a bit more involved, but nothing too bad. It's actually very well organized. I have to say, uh, the backend of Nintendo is really well organized. So the first time is getting to know the how it worked, but then the second time it took me like a few days to have a football ready on the on Nintendo Switch after having done racing. So they're pretty good uh, platform, pretty mature by this point. Um, uh, but you're right though in terms of um, the pixel art games on the Switch, they look fantastic. It's just there's something about it that the smaller display, that just make, makes them like um, feel at home on the Nintendo Switch. Yeah, it's 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 turned into a really great pl- platform for kind of retro style stuff as well, hasn't it? Yeah. It's, uh... Uh, totally. in, interesting that you mentioned Super Arcade Football there as well, because, um, you know, that kind of genre was dominated by sensible soccer and uh, uh, titles like Kickoff as well. Um, how, how did you make it stand out and, and, and be unique from these titles without trying to kind of replicate them? Yeah, good question. We didn't want to copy Sensible Soccer. Obviously, you know, it, it's, it's definitely that... Uh, same type of game as kickoff and uh, you know goal or sensible soccer but we got our own twist to the game uh, not just in terms of gameplay but there is also a story so the game is a bit more light-hearted there is not we're not trying to do a simulation uh like sensible soccer at the time was really cutting edge and was really a great game they really went to for like simulation at the time it was free which was excellent i loved the game uh, we went for something a bit more funny so there are a bit of funny things happen on the pitch as well. You can be hit by a meteorite, for instance. We got modifiers, so you can have like things like mud or um, oil streaks. So you can play with bigger goal posts as well. And you can even customize your own tournaments. So let's say you want to play with your friends uh, in the office or anywhere. Uh, you can set up your own tournament and then uh, say the, the tournament and progress with it. And plus, again, we got a story mode, but game super arcade football and super arcade racing uh, we really went to down with the story uh and like every fight levels there is a boss fight and then yeah. you basically <laughs> unlock the, the next stage of the story and uh, the story is done is told by uh, like um a little heads you know with text below and also uh we're using mod music uh for um amiga mod music for the for the sound for the music itself which was that made on the amiga as well like pro tracker or something or uh yeah i mean it's robin powell making the music she's great uh she's very very young she's uh when we started working together she was 20 21 years old uh but she's into uh the amiga and the retro scene as well and i i wanted to have authentic mod uh music on the on those games uh because i, I like the limitation of four channels and the the split left and right is really, really powerful. So uh, we actually develop our own mod player to play 100% like Amiga in Amiga quality. And it's 100% compatible with Amiga. And, if, and Robin produced the music in such a way this actually, it can actually be played on the Amiga. And the advantage of this is the, the, the retro feeling and sound. And also it doesn't take much memory. So the game is always fast to load. And plus, uh, for football, actually, the music was composed by uh, Barry Leach, which uh, you oh, might know. Oh, great. Uh, I, I had it on the podcast, actually. Did the, yeah, the many years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Legend. I, I was thinking as well, you know, playing that title, um, it was a really smart move um, to just make it a little bit slower. So when I've, whenever I play Sensible World of Soccer, it's, you know, blasting up the pitch and it, it, it travels really fast. But just that slight slowing down of the gameplay made it seem a bit more kind of 
tricky and a bit more uh, uh, requiring ty- ty- more timing and accuracy with it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That's something we did uh, on purpose because we tried the game uh, with lots of friends, family. We went to events and exhibitions and we saw kids playing uh, and it was important for us that the game was accessible to everyone. Uh, also, if you play the story mode, the, the, your team is quite slow at the beginning, but it gets faster as you get towards the end. But that, by that point, uh, you're quite familiar with the controls, so we can afford having a faster game, like closer to sensible soccer in terms of speed. So there is a balance there. Uh, you're right. It is quite important nowadays. Uh, if you pick pick up any of the classic retro games, they're very hard to play most of the time for, for modern players or modern standards and, and, and anyway. keep it simple as well. I think that's yeah. a really important thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes, I mean, I'm looking at this and like, you know, I, I can't play FIFA, modern FIFA. I, I get lost in it. But yeah, stuff like, you know, kick off, and games like that I can play. So this looks like a good balance, you know, for people that grew up with those games. Yeah, totally. It's great that you mentioned that because I remember mm. uh, before deciding to make um, Super Arcade Football, I went to a friend's house and he, he got an Xbox and we played FIFA together and I could not play the game. I, again, FIFA is great and people love it. I understand that. It's just not for me or for many people because I was there and I asked my wife, so, should we play together? We make a tournament. I don't know, we really, we did not enjoy the, the game at all. So it's not pick up and play, you know? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Well, another incredible game that, you know, I, I saw a lot of people loving, and I remember us talking about this on the podcast, because, um, you know, I love games like uh, Flashback, for example, and Prince of Persia. Um, Full Void, which is um, a real cinematic puzzle platformer game that is available now. Um, so where did the idea of this come from then? And why did you decide that you wanted, wanted to make a platform? Or what, what kind of inspired this? Uh, well, I still remember the day I put on uh, Another World of my Amiga and I watched the intro and I was so blown away that the game started. I didn't even understand I had to play the game. Uh, so it made a big impression on me. Uh, same with Prince of Persia. I was a big fan of the original Prince of Persia. I played that so much. I can speed run that game even now. Uh, so I always liked these types of games. And that's something I really felt I couldn't do on the iPhone or the iPad. I, I love, you know, the, 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 the iOS ecosystem platform at the time, but I wanted to do something along the lines of uh, classic cinematic p- puzzle platformers. So uh, after the experience with football and racing, I felt like we were ready to tackle something bigger. So as I said, we tried to do one step at a time within the company to not take too many risks. And once we develop something, and then we, we try to step it up. Uh, and again, there was one of the, the types of games I love the most, a uh, cinematic puzzle platformer. So we started working on uh, on Full Void. Uh, that was around 2020. And then I guess, you guess what happens, you know, having that, that year. Uh, there were lockdowns and it was yeah. especially hard for me because I had to replace key member, the members of the team during that time. And it wasn't, it was very hard to, look for people, interview and hire people. There was so much uncertainty. And also I had to take care of my two uh, twin girls, uh, which at the time were 11 years old and obviously were off school needed. So that, that was quite, uh, quite, um, quite tough uh, for me as a director of a company and um, a producer of games. Uh, so I kind of, uh, it helped me to, uh, during these times to, to kind of channel all my feelings into into this game, into full void, and I say, okay, now is the time to to really uh, make the puzzle platform I wanted to make, and that's why the game is so dark and dystopic in a way. Uh, I was, was going to say about the kind of dark dystopian theme. Um, uh, you know, uh, a world with no adults, kind of Lord of the Fly style as well. And uh, I I used to watch a TV show called The Tribe where all the adults died, and it, it's <laughs> kind of got that vibe. Um, yeah, where were the influences uh, from and what was your kind of like design mood board that you guys had? Yeah, yeah, many influences really. Uh, at the time, I was reading a book uh, called The Tripods, which was uh, is from an English author and uh, is about, uh, I don't know, there was a BBC series in the 80s as well about the tripods as well. They're like kids and at some point... Uh, Basically, they're, they're free until they are 12 and then they, they put a chip on their brain and then they, they become a slave. So it's a long story, but it's really, really good. So the tripods is one of the influence. I'm also a fan of uh, 
I like some comic books, like uh, there is one which is very obscure. It's called Giver. Um, uh, it's basically uh, a kid that finds um, an armor and then he can basically uh, connect with the armor. It's like connected with biology. So there is a lot of biology in, uh, in, in it, which we kind of link to Full Void as well. If you play the game at some point, it kind of plays a role as well. Uh, also, Stranger Things is, you know, it's very, very much uh, an inspiration in terms of the mood and the music and the atmosphere as well. Uh, Lord of the Flies is one of my favorite books as well, for some reason. Yeah. I, don't know. I read it when I was little. That's uh, an so impression. Like, life an impression, for, yeah. uh, for sure, for sure. It's what my school uh, was like when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, and I really had this idea where, um, again, uh, there was this teenager, which is the main character of Full Void, uh, and it's alone and you don't know why. You know, something is wrong with the world, right? You don't know why. And um, by playing the game, we decided, as opposed to uh, racing football, we decided to tell the story uh, without text or mm. dialogues. So no text whatsoever, apart from the main menu, you know, the interface. So the, the story is told by environmental storytelling. And that was quite a challenge for us. Uh, but it was mostly Leonardo, uh, Miles, and myself working on the game. So uh, Leo and Miles are pixel artists. So they retired at some point, and um, I, Leonardo contacted me, and he was uh, fresh out of uni, was looking for an internship. Uh, and we had a chat, and uh, I really like his attitude, and he's very versatile. And so he joined the company around the time we, we were making Full Void. Uh, and then we got Miles on board, which is a fantastic pixel artist and is really good with the environment as well. And basically the three of us uh, made most of the game. They, they did the graphic, I did the programming. And then we had Tom Cullen join us at the end of the project for uh, animations because we really, really went to, uh, and put lots and lots of animation in the game. Everything you see in full voice is undrawn and hand animated. There is no like 3D yeah, it looks stunning as well. And I mean, even in terms of the gameplay as well, because I'm thinking back to, you know, you mentioned a couple of games that, you know, I, I loved playing when I was a kid, you know, Another World, Flashback, Prince of Persia. And I can definitely see the influence here as well. But how do you kind of balance the, you know, the different styles of play? You know, because you've got platforming, you've got puzzles as well. And also, I mean, thinking back to those classic titles I mentioned, you often got some parts of the game that felt a little bit unfair or, you know, some kind of cheap, cheap deaths. <laughs> I think you, you probably term them. How did you kind of avoid that then? Did you, did you learn anything from those classic titles, like what not to do? Yeah, uh, that was quite tricky actually, because yeah, if you play those games now without save states, they're, they're quite challenging. Um, so I also like a modern uh, puzzle platformer like Limbo, Inside, Little Nightmares as well. So that's also something that I played. And, and I like uh, the only my only problem with those games is that they're great, but I can't play them with my kids because they don't like violence or gore. So in Full yeah. Void, even though the game is a bit dystopic, we try to stay away from it. And in terms of balancing the difficulty, we put lots of checkpoints in the game. So if you die, you don't restart from the beginning of the level, and that that really helps. I think that's kind of creepier as well, not having the actual um, violence and stuff in there. Because uh, it's like suggested, like yes. know, what's going on, but you don't really know the details. Yeah, that, that's true in a way. Yeah, it's like a horror film, right? When you when you see the monster, it's like yeah, nah, I don't like it anymore, right? Yeah, leave like, it to the imagination. Just, yeah, yeah, it's best to leave to the imagination. And also, every single death has a, a different animation sequence, and other studios wouldn't put that much effort in. And, uh, you know, doing that as a move, I, I think that's really great because that kind of focuses on that on that time period of uh, gaming, you know, uh, especially with, you know, flashback and the death sequences that you had on that. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, we really had fun making the death animation. Uh, uh, we call them fail animation because <laughs> on some platform <laughs> we're not allowed to say that. So it's fail animation. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, uh, that was really good. We, so we started with one or two, and then we, we said, oh, okay, we could do this one. And there that, are that even a couple that you only see in two places, which is, you know, we spend like five days making those animations. But, 
you know, if you find them, that's great. There is an achievement if you die in all the possible ways. So you see all the, all the animations. And again, that, that goes back to the fact that I really like, uh, I was not expecting this uh, when I started Full Void, but during the process of making the game, I really fell in love with working with the talented artists and animators. And it's so good to work with them. And the advantage of doing 2D games is that really, and being a small team, we can go from idea to implementation in one day. So we say, okay, why don't we do this in this place of the you know, this part of the game? And the guy go, oh, but we will do something else instead. They got great ideas and then they draw it and then we put it in the game and it's there. It's so quick in terms of, you know, with 3D quite often you need someone doing the modeling, the rigging, the texturing and all the rest of it. Uh, and it's quite, you know, it takes time to put it in the game. Uh, it's one of the advantages to the yeah, and also having like hacking in there is, is is a really cool element, but also having a companion. So, you know, you're, you're not just solving puzzles by yourself. You're using your companion um, to solve puzzles. And, and it, it, it kind of feels like you're not so isolated in this world. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah you're spot on. So the, the, it was quite challenging because uh, the, the main character is a little kid, so he can't really fight. He hasn't got any weapon. So in terms of gameplay and to keep the game interesting, in terms of progression of, of like uh, difficulty progression, it was really hard to come up with stuff that we wanted the player to do. Uh, and one of the solutions was, okay, you're there, you can't really do anything yourself because you're a little kid, but you got a backpack, you got a computer, you're a hacker and you can hack stuff. And that really unlocked a new dimension for the game uh, because then yes, you can actually uh, kind of fight back, but not directly. And it's also good for puzzle because, again, it, it means you have to uh, plan in advance what you want to do. And then uh, you're right, like most of the game you're alone, but at some point you find a companion. And I think I think that's a great moment because then it's, oh, okay, I'm not on my own. I'm not completely on my own. And obviously in the story, the, there is flashback as well. So you see there is a connection between you and the companion and your family basically there. Yeah, and I think the fact that hacking has, you know, been so big in, in media over the last decade, games like Watch Dogs and uh, Mr. Robot, a TV series I love, it seems like it's quite, you know, quite on trend to have a, a hacking element in a game. Cool. Yeah, I've not watched it, actually. I need to watch it. Oh, yeah, definitely worth a watch. <laughs> well, let's talk about the music in the game, because, I mean, that is incredibly atmospheric. And you mentioned about, you know, the, the fact that there was, uh, in those earlier titles, you using the Amiga. Um, what about in this game, though? I mean, in, in Full Void, how did the music work in that game and uh are you surprised at the reaction because i know people love that soundtrack yeah yeah uh, and again it was robin powell she did an amazing job and it's still mod music oh wow it's still amiga mod music yes oh, it's so uh, atmospheric it's uh, yeah. she's so good she's so good it's really got that symphony kind of um, yeah uh, I, uh, inspiration you know yeah, she's very versatile, so she can do, uh, you know, we gave her references, of course, but then she went to town and she did lots and lots of different uh, takes, uh, so much so that we decided to put the soundtrack available for anyone. So if you uh, go to our website, outofthebeat.com, the soundtrack is there. You can download the soundtrack for free, MP3 and mod music, and you can play on your Amiga. I'm going to DJ some of those tunes for uh, sure, please. definitely. You've got yeah. my permission. You can do what you want with those mods. Uh, I, I'll mix Go them in, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite a short title um, uh, to complete it. How important was having um, achievements in there to, you know, lengthen the game and add a bit more fun? Yeah, that, that's... Um, uh, we wanted... Our target for Full Void was to give people, like, an experience like watching a film or reading a, a short book or a comic, right? So I like, when I read a comic, I like the fact that, you know, you read the comic, it's over and the story is finished. You know, you don't milk it forever for like, uh, and there is a start and an end to the story. So I, the idea with Full Boy was to give people like a story and then end the story and that's it. So our target was about two hours. We ended up exceeding. So I think the game, if you play the first time, it's about, three and a half hours of gameplay, which is good. Some people find it short in terms of uh, game compared to most games, but that wasn't our target, to be yeah. fair. Uh, I, I just wanted to give 
this experience to people and then then be done and with it's the also end. a small team as well you know if you're doing every death sequence and you're making a, a you know 16 hour long game yeah play, yeah yeah keep in mind everything every single screen is hand drawn we don't use styles uh it's every screen is custom is hand drawn and every animation is handmade uh so it's a lot of work but it's not just that as the as i said the main character can't really fight is a little kid. So there is only so much you can do in terms of puzzle and platforming. And I didn't want to dilute the game and make the game six hours for no reason. I, I you know, I would love to make the game six, ten, ten hours, probably no more than that, because I, I don't like the games are too long, right? Yeah. Uh, I like that you are able to finish a game because of myself, when I see the a game is 100, 300 hours, I'm not even... <laughs> No, to me, to me, three hours is a good length because it is a game that I, you know, I've got a good chance of completing. Because there are some games like they've got the tutorials are three hours long. And it's like you know, yeah. you feel like you've only scratched the surface of them. And obviously, if you're aiming at you know players that were into retro games and these original titles back then, a lot of them are growing up. They've got families, they've got jobs. So you know, time is at a premium, really. So I don't think it's a bad thing at all. Yeah, exactly. That, that was our aim. I wanted people to be able to enjoy Full Void from start to finish, yeah. and maybe if they liked it, to say, you know what, I like this this game. I'm waiting for the next game from this company, right? And that, that's what we want to do. Well, one thing I love about um, Full Void is um, not only is it on, like, you know, the, the mainstream platforms, if you like, but also you um, you released it on the Evercade um, at the end of last year. And having it on that system, I think, is really cool. I mean, we've had the Evercade guys on the podcast before, and I love their, their ethos and, you know, the fact that they curate their collections, you know, they they're, they're don't just put anything out. And actually, I believe Full Void's got the accolade of being the, the first ever single game cartridge on the Evercade, which is massive. So tell us how you got involved and how special that feels. Yeah, that, that feels very, very special. Uh, I, you know, I'm so happy and proud to have the game on, on the Evercade. Uh, as I said, I started the company making games for uh, mobile phones and to have something physical, like a cartridge, you actually put on a device and the box and the manual, it's, it's great. So how it started, so... We went to Nottingham. So everything starts in Nottingham. I don't know, guys. Yeah, center of the world, Nottingham, yeah. <laughs> it's center of the world, you tell me, you tell me. So I was in Nottingham for the Video Game Expo in uh, 2022. Uh, it was around November, December, uh, I believe. And uh, also there, um, I think I met you guys there for the first time, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and there were also Liam and Mark from the Evercade Evolution magazine, which is a fun magazine for the Evercade. Yeah, that's is a great, great one, actually. Really yeah. good shout uh, to those guys because that's yeah. such a niche. And um, yeah, it's, it's yes. such a cool little magazine. Very well written yeah. as well. Yeah, it's so cool that something like this exists, like the Evercade and a fun magazine for the Evercade. How cool is that? Huh? And so they went there and I started chatting with them because I, I love the fact that there was a magazine about Evercade. At the time, I did not own an Evercade. I wanted to buy one. So I got to talk to them. How is this model? What do you suggest? And they were very, very friendly, and they they saw that we were making games as well. And uh, so uh, at some point I got to a hotel, and then I got an email from Liam saying, oh, you know what, I put you in contact with the, the people at Blaze because I think your games are great. Football racing would work great on the Evercade. And I was really blown away. I was like, oh, thank you so much, Liam. You, you're so kind. Uh, honestly, just unprompted. It, it's, it's great what events and communities can do. Uh, so I was very thankful to them. Uh, so he got me in touch with the um, uh, um, uh, CTO and uh, CEO of Blaze. And uh, they came over to our office in Wimbledon. We had lunch together and they, obviously we talk about football racing, but they saw Full Void. And I think they really, really liked it because on the spot they said, you know, I think we can make this uh, the first single game cartridge on the Evercade and was, oh, if you want to do that, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. On my part, I said, it will make sure we have a great, um, great assets to go along with the, with the, with the, with the game for the physical release. Uh, the guys were very excited in the office to work on the Evercade as well. So they started working on an art book and my spend a lot of time working on the art book together with Leo. Mm-hmm. And so if you get the, there are two editions for the Evercade, the regular and the special edition as well. The special edition has got the art, it's got the art book, which is really, really good. Uh, both of them, they got also a comic that we did for the Evercade version, 
with a prelude story, the, the backstory of Full Void, what happens before the game starts, which is great as well. So it's, it was really nice to do something custom, something physical for the Evercade. So we got the art book, we got um, the comic for both editions, uh, and then the manual, uh, the people at Blaze, the, the, the team did a fantastic job with the manual. We provided the assets, but they really put it together in a, an amazing way. When I saw it, I was blown away. It's really a good manual. I love the fact that you're kind of going from, uh, you know, a digital download on something like the Switch and then hitting physicality on like an obscure system yes. like the Evercade. It's, it's really good. Yeah, my life is going backwards. I'm going from digital to physical. <laughs> <laughs> you know, speaking of which, actually, because obviously we see a lot of titles coming out on modern platforms that then get backported to like retro systems. So would that be anything you'd ever maybe consider doing? I mean, I'm looking at, you know, Full Void, I'm thinking that would probably play pretty well on like the Dreamcast or something. I mean, would that ever be something that you look at doing like games for retro systems? Yeah, totally. I do rule it out. In fact, I had a look at the, the specs for the Dreamcast specifically. Uh, the Dreamcast is feasible. Uh, the main limitation is the 16 megabytes of memory, but there are ways around it. So I, you know, I started looking into it. Uh, in between things, when I got time, I would love to bring it to the Dreamcast. I also started playing with the Scorpion engine for the Amiga, but it's, it's a bit tough to, to squeeze full wide uh, in there. Who knows? Maybe one day. Watch this space. <laughs> yeah, with all these powerful accelerators, you never know. Um, oh, yes, yes. I can do with the accelerators, yes. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering, are there, like, you've explored FPS, you've explored sports games and uh, racing there. Are there any other genres you'd like to get into? Uh, yeah, yeah, I probably. Uh, I would have my explore uh, uh, types of games. But at the moment, uh, I really like the experience with Full Void. And uh, I think we got we, we got another games we want to make see in the similar style. But uh, I love you guys, so I can tell you guys a few things. <laughs> Never no, one's listen, no one's listening, only us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just us. So yeah, basically, um, again, uh, out a bit, we are a small team. Uh, I like to see the company a little bit like a small studio from the 90s, but nowadays. So it's just a handful of people make, uh, working together to make, handcrafted games and the things for me is you know in an age where we got really 3d um ai images uh we're trying to, to do everything by hand like i mentioned to draw everything by hands uh and it takes time but you know when people see the results i think they really like to see the the hand of the artist it's like when you read a comic book and you and you can recognize uh the way the comic book is drawn like you know you can recognize Akira Toriyama for instance right yeah. that's nice and it's something you don't see when you got 50 people working on a game you know you shouldn't see it actually uh so again uh we'll have a game that we want to announce soon uh what i can tell you is that it's not a sequel to full void it's a new story so we got a new story to tell and and we double the resolution and we double down on the amount of animations. So oh, well. we already have about 2,000 animations in the new game implemented. Uh, to make it possible, basically, we made the change to the engine to have a file format that allows for really, really uh, long sequences of animations uh, without taking memory uh, or much memory, really. So we can really compress and put more animation. What we want to do is to show people more handcrafted animation. Uh, as we are not in lockdown anymore, thankfully, uh, then next game is going to be very colorful and very um, a different. It's a different universe compared to Full Void. But I think if you enjoy Full Void, you're going to love the new game. And uh, we can't wait to announce it. So what I can say, if, you know, people can follow us on social uh, for updates. And again. Uh, when we got something ready to show, we will we'll be very happy to show it. Yeah, I'm well, sure we'll be talking about it on the podcast as well. I'm sure we will. And it was uh, fantastic to see you get some accolades as well at the uh, Debug Indie Games Awards. Oh, it was unbelievable. Honestly, I was not. We were not expecting to win. There are so many great games. We're we're very happy to be there. Just to be there was great. Uh, so when they call our name, they mentioned Full Void. We had a couple of seconds before we realized, okay, it's us. So that was fantastic. It was so good. I, I was very happy for the team as well because they put their hearts into the game and it, it's great to see the people like the game, people love the game and 
they uh, stopped to talk to us as well, which was fantastic. Well, Ali, um, you know, it's, it's amazing to see in this uh, this day and age of, you know, these massive AAA titles out there. And sometimes people complain about lack of innovation in modern gaming. You know, great to see a studio with these sensibilities of these games that we grew up playing and that great small team feel as well. And I love the fact that you're using systems like the Amiga for graphics and audio and bringing them to new players and new platforms. It's just incredible. And, you know, as someone who grew up playing games like Another World and Flashback, you know, Four Void just looks absolutely amazing. So that is available now on uh, current platforms, including the Evercade as well. So if people want to uh, check out your website and your socials, I'll link them in the show notes as well. And uh, best of luck with the next title as well. Hope it goes well. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to talk to you guys. 